everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the Martini, Candid Conversations with a Twist. My name is Gus and I'm Erie Rentals Director of Business Development for North America. And I've been with the Erie family now for 17 years and honored to be your host today. At Erie Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmaker, with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK where we bring you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment, wherever you may be. Our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and we value the relationships that we've built on trust. As a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab today, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the course of the show. We are very, very fortunate to have with us today the truly awesome Rachel Morrison. Rachel has a background in photojournalism and has completed her master's degree at the American Film Institute. She then went on to shoot eight projects which premiered at Sundance over seven years. And in 2018, Rachel became the first woman nominated for Best Cinematography at the Academy Awards. In addition, she is the first woman to have lensed a Marvel superhero movie. Rachel is the mother of two beautiful children and is an avid surfer. Rachel's projects as cinematographer include Fruitvale Station, which won the Sundance Grand Jury and Audience Award, the indie breakout hit Dope, the Oscar-nominated Best Documentary, What Happened, Miss Simone, the ASC and Oscar-nominated Best Cinematography film, Mudbound, and then the massive box office hit for Marvel, Black Panther. She's been transitioning into directing lately, and she's uh, directed episodes for the upcoming Star series, Hightown, which premieres this uh, coming weekend, May 17th. That's awesome. <laughs> Welcome, Rachel, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me, Gussie. <laughs> it, uh, it's been too long since I've seen you. I miss you, and I wish I was uh, able to get together with you and have a cup of coffee or something, hopefully soon. <laughs> Martini. A martini would be great, yeah. <laughs> um, so I usually start these things with a couple of fun icebreakers. I hope you're okay with that. Nothing too crazy. <laughs> I got so, mom. Just know that I'm slow. Ah, all good, all good. <laughs> so on the uh, subject of martinis, um, <laughs> Noah Greenberg actually asked me, what kind of gin do you prefer using in your martini? I'm actually, I'm not, I'm, I'm more of a whiskey girl than a gin girl. But, oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> All good. Well, I was going to ask you next if it was whiskey or bourbon. Ooh, both. Does both okay. count? Yeah, yeah, that counts. That works. <laughs> no problem. And then we get into the more difficult subject matter, and that's film or digital. You know, I have a complicated answer for that. I am on the, in a perfect world, if, you know, money and time were no issue, I would shoot digital by night and film by day. I, I think, um, you know, I, I think obviously they both, it's all project dependent and, you know, certain projects call for each medium regardless. But, you know, my experience shooting film on this last feature, I lit a set scene for night at, you know, it was anamorphic, so 2.8, I think 500, which I was, I think I was rating at 640. So I still had a little attitude there and it was bright as fuck. And I was like, I was like, sorry guys, we're in your orgy. It was like me, the other operator, two ACs. It, just, it was a very different, you know, I think actors have gotten so accustomed to, I mean, a mudbound I was lighting with, you know, devil wick candles. And here I am, you know, lighting this room and it's like, Chris, it was Kristen Stewart and Anthony Mackey. And it was, it's just a different ambiance, you know? And I think for that reason alone, digital really brings something to the table for, for night scenes, you know, in certain, in certain circumstances. But nothing holds, a, like, you know, nothing holds a candle to film, a film in the day, you know? A film in the day is just, like, magical. Yeah. And how about anamorphic versus spherical? That's completely project dependent. You know, I, I love... Right now, I think, especially in, in the digital age, glass is kind of the one way we tell ourselves apart. It's so particular to each story. You know, it's not even just anamorphic or spherical, it's which, which anamorphic, you know, glass is right, which spherical glass is right, and it's it just so project dependent. Um, 
So I love them both for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. I appreciate you letting me indulge in that fun little uh, first 60 seconds. <laughs> So would you um, please share with us your origin story? Um, I, you know, there's the adult me that goes back and like intellectualizes the subconscious choice to get into photography, right? And, you know, I, as a kid, I mean, I, I started super early and I think it was, you know, there's a lot of health issues and loss in, in my life and it was like, photo was the way to catch to freeze time, right? It's as simple as that. And I got really into photography, you know, and, and it was also, I mean, at the time it was processing in a dark room by yourself. And I was the angsty teenager who wanted that time by myself with, you know, pixies or whatever playing in my, in my I think it was a Walkman. Um, and so it was just, it, it sort of spoke to who I was then and then it just continued to evolve. You know, I, 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 I saw a foreign film when I was maybe in, eighth or ninth grade and it was it was like and it's just this sort of you know it's not like um a well-known film by any means but it was eye-opening for me it was the first film I'd seen that was sort of it was outside of the box and I was just like this is something I want to do um and then you know as I realized that you can tell these complete stories in cinema you know but but photography through the lens 24 frames a second that sort of became a no-brainer for me. Well, actually, I wouldn't say it's a no-brainer. The hardest choice I've ever had, I'm very fortunate that I've always known what I wanted to do, but the hardest choice I had to make was photo or film. I was sort of, I was going the photojournalism route, you know, for much of my high school and undergrad life, and even a little bit after school, it was like I was taking my photo portfolio around by day and my reel around by night, and kind of trying to have, you know, a foot in each world. And at some point, somebody was like, they're, they're just different careers, you have to choose. And that, that was the hard choice for me. Um, and ultimately, I think I realized, you know, film is all about collaboration. And that's, you know, for, I think that more than anything else was like, do I want, I mean, the photo that I was interested in was actually like conflict photography, you know, and street photography, but like very individualist. I was not interested in fashion photography. I was not interested in, you know, the kind of things that require bigger teams. And so it was like, do I want a, a career by myself or a career surrounded by other people, working with other people? And, and that was how I chose film. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> Is there, during that period of time, um, outside of that foreign film, which I'd be really interested to see if you remember which one that was, but was there any other artists that were really inspiring you? Um, the, the film was actually a French-Canadian film called Laola. Um, which I think you can get on like VHS. Oh. The director, I, I looked not too long ago to kind of see whatever happened to that director. And unfortunately he died in a, I think it was a small plane crash, like not long after that film. Um, and it's just, it's sort of this slightly magical realism, you know, narrative kind of coming of age. Um, I just thought it was such a beautiful and moving film. And, and then from there I went into, I went into a full like, sort of magical realism binge, you know, everything from, from Wong Kar Wai and, and that kind of take on, on realism to Rat Catcher and Lynn Ramsey and, you know, City of Lost, of Lost Children and, and Delicatessen and Jeanette, you know, all of them. And then I was reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Salman Rushdie, like all of this vein. And then if you look at my work, it's so funny because I have gone completely, and my work is very naturalistic, largely. Um, you know, and it's usually inspired, you know, a lot of it's inspired by true events. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not the track I went on, but it was what got me inspired to get into film in the first place. Maybe, maybe someday I'll revisit it. You found a beautiful balance of the cinema look within that photorealistic journalism, because when we look at, you know, some of the images later on, like you said, you're in an environment that's realistic and gritty, but there is a beautiful beautiful look to it. That's definitely your own. So, um, <laughs> how about mentors? Did you have any mentors growing up or, you know, as you entered the industry that really pushed you? So out? I have a kind of funny story that involves Maddie Boutique, which is my, I was in, un, I was maybe an undergrad or just after, and I had seen Pi and you know, nobody, I mean, you know, a bunch of indie film kids and, and probably three other people had seen that movie. And I heard he was coming to town to do this other movie. And I just, you know, bugged the hell out of everybody to be on the movie as a PA, but I was like, I want to be the camera PA. 
and you know of course it went to the PA position went to the like you know nephew of the director or the writer or somebody and I was you know a PA PA but I just sort of followed the camera department around like puppy dog and you know by the end of you know picked you know tried to pick Maddie's brain every chance I could and um by the end of it he gave me a chance to load a mag of film and maybe he told me how he and the department taught me how to load and how to you know how to unload or whatever and um I flashed a mag and I was like mortified and I you know didn't know what to do and I didn't know whether it was an exposed mag and like do I tell him don't I tell him like and I and I was so traumatized by that. I did tell him it ended up being okay. I think, you know, Maddie loves kind of flashing anyway. I think probably it like added something to it. But I was so traumatized by that that I never followed up with him. I never, like, you know, he might have been the one person who I could have along the way have said, you know, I don't know. But I was, you know, that was the movie between Pi and, and Requiem. And, you know, of course I would have loved to be on Requiem, but I was too mortified by that experience to even ask. And so now, I mean, 10 years later, I, I or much more than that, but um, Maddie and I are friends and, you know, I, I certainly re-engaged with him at some point after I got over the trauma of it. But I, I wasn't, I was never the kid in film school who went up to the guest lecturers and sort of said, hey, I'm looking for an internship. Like I, I that was too much for me, you know? Um, so the, so the, the sort of roundabout, I spun my wheels answer for, for that is that I actually didn't. And it meant that every film set that I was on of my own was the biggest films that I'd ever been on. I'd, I've never been, I'd never been on, you know, when I went on to Black Panther, I'd never been, been around a set that big. Um, so I sort of had to learn by doing, but. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, how about collaborations? Um, can you speak to the ones that have been, you know, for you the most dear and really uh, stand out? Ryan Coogler is the, the, the no-brainer. I mean, there are so many, right? Like I, I've become very close with, I think, all the directors I've shot with. So much of yourself to a project and, you, you know, you really do kind of enmesh brains and minds and hearts and, and you become a family for a little bit and you go to war together and it's like you go through this journey that it's hard. I mean, I can't imagine ever not, I don't know, remaining close to the people who I went down those paths with, but you know, Ryan above and beyond. I mean, from, from our first Skype interview, it was two hours long. I think there were tears shed, there were stories, like, and we just, there was such a profound connection that like, I mean, I, you know, in some ways I really feel like he was, he was the brother I'd always wanted and never had. And, and so, I mean, he's like family, um, obviously. Um, and then everybody, I mean, Rick Femi, he was amazing. And, you know, we talk regularly. He, um, but yeah, I mean, Ryan's the one that like, yeah. And then, you know, on, 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 on my crew tip, I haven't had the, I don't know if it's a budget thing, but like, or the fact that so many of my projects are location-based. So I'm, you know, I'm not in the same place that often, but I haven't had the luxury of bringing that many of my crew with me on, on every job. So it's not like I have the gaffer who's done every project with me. Um, but, you know, one of the crew members that really, meant the most, and it was Zoran, who passed away a few years ago, mm. but um, he, you know, we did three projects together. Zoran Basilic is a first AC. He probably butchered the pronunciation of his last name, but oh. um, anyway, <laughs> that's a that was very meaningful to me. You know, he, he was also, you know, my, my father had passed away. He, you know, he was like a father figure, and maybe some of that was, you know, you know meaningful. Yeah. No, Zoran, it was an amazing, just professional and just, it, I had the pleasure of working with him several times as well and we miss him, yeah. Amazing person. Um, so when you, when you get onto a project and you're meeting the director, what, what are the, like the first priorities that you set when you're establishing a look for a project? When I start before getting onto the project. I think your very first interview you're sort of making sure that you're on the same page, you know? I mean, I, I try not to take projects where it's clear that we have different visions for the thing. Um, so usually by the time I'm on a project, we're already kind of starting, starting the very early process of, of mind melding. Um, but usually, you know, it starts with, you know, what's the, what is the story we're telling? 
whose story in, in any given moment, you know, I mean, especially with ensemble cast, sometimes you have to really be clear about the emotional arcs and, and kind of where you are with each character at any given time, um, you know, and the stakes of the moment. I mean, I think when we do start to talk about the work, my work anyway, like that's, subjectivity is everything to me. You know, like I, I feel like if, if there's anything consistent about my work, you know, cause obviously the films are kind of all over the place, but it's that I really, you know, have a, a, a mind and a heart to, to the sub, subjectivity of the story that we're telling. So I, that's, that's usually where we start. And then, you know, references are great. Um, it's good to know where the director's head is at technically. You know, some directors are very, technically proficient and you know they know what a 40 millimeter does they know what anamorphic is versus spherical they know what film is versus digital and then other directors can kind of point to things that they like but maybe not articulate why and so you know references are nice to at least try to understand what they're seeing you know especially when they you know not everyone can articulate it for themselves um and then yeah i mean I mean, ideally you're sort of listening to music together, going to museums. I mean, that's when, that's when you have the luxury of time, which most of my films never had, but you just start to like get into this world together and send, you know, send references back and forth and, you know, highlight, highlight things and talk about them. That, that, that's kind of the idea. Gotcha. Is there, is there um, a particular project or reference that you find yourself kind of gravitating back to on several of your projects in the past? I mean, I don't, I think Brian probably brought it to the table, but we referenced a profit for Fruit Bell, I think. And it just it does seem to keep coming back. That very experiential, submersive, um, you know, single camera feel. Um, and, you know, and I think, I think it's something that I responded to, you know, it felt like a good reference for the work that I was already doing in some ways. Um, and so that's one that comes back a lot. Um, what else? I think that's a great place for us to maybe bring up some of the images from Fruitvale, if that's cool with you. And we kind of look at those. And uh, that was, for me, it's a very special project because that's the first time I, I met you and yeah. uh, we got to work together. So that was cool. Yes, uh, you, <laughs> you helped us make that film. I mean, we made that film for $650,000, I think, on Super 16. Um, and it would, <laughs> literally would not have been possible with that. Well, that was... And, and Aries Generosity and, you know, Kodak, I think, worked with us too. Yeah. Photocam. Yeah. And a, a shout out to my uh, colleague, Ann Tran, who introduced us. You know, I miss her and uh, <laughs> it's exciting to see that she's working and doing some projects of her own now. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So I just love looking at these images and just seeing that 16 millimeter grain. It's just, it's gorgeous. <laughs> so this still that we're looking at right now, we shot in, um, is it San Quentin? What's the one, uh, the, the prison, I think it is San Quentin. That, that's, no, yeah, that's that just off of the Bay Area, San Quentin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, the, and they basically, we had to do it with a very, very limited crew. I don't remember the numbers, but it was like, I don't know we had to pick like eight, eight people or 10 people who could be in this space because we were really in prison with them. Um, you know, it was in sort of the entry area, kind of the processing area, I guess. And all of the extras were actual inmates who were kind of, you know, on good behavior and who they felt like would, would, it was almost like a creative outlet for them. And then because there were so few of us, like the, you know, we had our own sort of Maddie, our locations uh, scout was, was, playing one of the visitors, you know, it was like a crew member with an inmate in the background. And I think almost the entire, you know, all of the crew that, that worked in that scene, like it, it was one of the most sort of life-changing moments from their film experiences, just talking to these inmates, you know, as, as background. Um, I don't know, it was, it was, you know, this whole, I mean, Fruitville was incredibly transformative for a number of reasons for me, but, um, you know, we also were in a lot of the same places where Oscar was, you know, we shot mm -hmm. where he was killed, literally in, in the spot where he was killed. And we were, you know, shot in the morgue where he was processed and you could look through the log and sort of see the entry, you know, for when he was brought in and, and you know, he, he had been in San Quentin. So all of these things really felt his spirit with us as we were making the film. 
That's really cool. And then um, another one that's uh, beautiful that you and I worked on together is Little Accidents. Mm -hmm. Really cool film. That was um, that was Cheaper Thirty Five, and that was in um, West Virginia, West Virginia. Um, and I mean, it is such like such a treat to shoot anywhere where, where the environment becomes like a character. Appalachia obviously is, you know, a visual candy. It's also, I mean, it's all, all, all of these things, you know, both amazing and also really tragic. Um, but yeah, it's a film that, that I don't know, I don't know if it got as, as big an audience as I would have liked, but I, I'm really proud to work on the film and it, it was just, it was also a really incredible experience. Great crew. Mm -hmm. That's what Holbrook is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, the locations were so cool. Um, it was really, I mean, you guys were in the thick of it. I remember driving up there um, and just was like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is a whole other world. It's amazing. Yeah. I love Two Perp 35. I feel like, um, I don't know, I need to, I need to figure out what I can shoot, what I, oh, you no, know, yeah, Seabird wasn't because we were in Morphic, but. Mm. <laughs> and after this, was it, uh, I think you went right into Dope after this? I recall. <laughs> I think you might recall better than I do. This is what <laughs> um, yeah, that's very possible. Sounds right. Yeah. Um, and dope was digital. And dope was an was spherical. I mean, sorry, dope was anamorphic. Will Aston's was spherical. Um, dope was where I discovered the G series, which I, I really like for sort of a more contemporary look. Um, mm. Sorry, Panavision, but no, but, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Um, and that was another tiny, tiny budget. I mean, we were two and a half million, I think, you know, running around LA. We had decided, we, Rick and I didn't want to be too handheld. You know, we felt like it was a little tropey and, you know, urban films, handheld, blah, 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 blah. And like, but we wanted to keep it moving. And so figuring out ways, between, you know, to, to do that. And I mean, I'm such a handheld person kind of instinctively. Um, but you know, it's just, this was, I liked, I liked conceptually what we were trying to do. It just meant like golf cart rigs and, you know, easy rigs and steady ham and dolly and slider and, you know, you know um, I forget what's the thing that is like a very mobile, um, Dana dolly, you know, and speed rail, just trying to keep the camera moving a lot without being a handheld. Mm. Um, very nice. And I, and I'm sorry, I did skip over cake. Cake was before dope, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of one word titles. Um, right. So yeah, cake was, um, was cake. Oh, cake might've been G series. Yeah. I think it was anamorphic as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think dope might be before cake. I don't know. It all blurs together. Um, very, very close together. It was, I remember, speaking to you and you were doing those and it was very close, but both were anamorphic though. And it was really, it was nice. Such a godsend. I was, I was pregnant during dope, I think. Yeah. Because it's, it's always fun to say I was pregnant shooting dope. Um, but so I, uh, yeah, it was nice to be home and cake was at home too. And it's like, it feels so rare to get to shoot things in LA. You know, Cake was interesting. I met with Ben, uh, sorry, with Daniel Barnes. Ben Barnes is his husband and the producer. Uh, I met with Daniel initially, and, you know, Cake was a big chance for me, right? It was, I think it was six or seven million, which at the time was still, you know, far more than I'd ever had before. And um, it was Jen Aniston, who was a big actress. And, you know, and I, I remember being so nervous because I wanted, I basically had made my mind up that if we were going to have to shoot her with beauty light and, and kind of chase her around like we did, you know, like she's always basically always been shot between friends and every comedy she'd ever been with, been in, then it just, I, I wasn't going to do it, which was like a very bold move for, for me at the time. Um, and thankfully, you know, Daniel was like, no, absolutely not, like very much on the same page, that this had to be a gen that nobody would ever seen before. And, you know, that she had, when they, you know, agreed to make the movie, that she had really said she was willing to go there. 
Now that never, I mean, you never know what that actually translates to, especially when you've only ever seen an actress wrapped in soft light, like whether going there for them is, you know, okay, you can back the soft light off, you know, an extra six inches um, or what I was planning, which is not beauty lighter. Um, and thankfully she was amazingly brave. You know, that was like the very powerful and dramatic role for her, you know, and to be photographed like that. Um, that was great. Um, ah. <laughs> we had to hire two extra grips on that movie just to sort of stave off the paparazzi because, you know, it was Dennis in any way. I think it's probably one of the most pop popped celebrity there is, but then you compound that with her looking like crap. Every paparazzi wants to break that story. So we had to build these like tunnels of solids to get her to and from set. Oh my gosh. People like pop, pop, pop spotting, you know, like it'd be like somebody climbing a tree. I mean, it's bananas. That's yeah. crazy. Having that life. <laughs> um, and then there was the documentary um, that you were working on and uh, was this with several other filmmakers, captions? Igor Martinovich was the, you're talking about uh, what happened with Simone? Right. Mm -hmm. So Igor and I co-shot that, that doc. Um, and he, I would say, probably did more of the heavy lifting, at least. Like, he did all the interviews. Um, and I did the film. Re like, I basically got to go shoot 16 mil and 8 mil and all the film sort of reproduction. Um, which it was very kind of... of Liz to give me a I mean, it gets used a lot, I guess. Um, but, you know, and, and there's, it's a lot of archival too. So maybe it's like, I don't, anyway, it was a, a we co-shot that and it was, Liz is amazing. And, and I'm really proud of the film. I think it's a, a good film. So. Yeah, uh, it's really cool. That must've been a fun kind of move to do something like that too, a little different. I mean, also I love documentary, you know, like that's, that's really where I came from. And to be honest, if they didn't take so damn long, I would keep doing it. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I love shooting docs and I love watching docs, but it's like to get anything worthwhile, it's spending two years with the subject, five years with the subject, or coming back and forth. And it's like, it's so hard anyway to kind of, you know, plan your schedule around something like that. And then you throw kids in the mix and it's just forget about it. Um, so it's, it's more like, I, you know, when I get a chance, like this one was a, we had a set weekend to shoot a bunch of film, you know, recreations, like, of course, I'd love to. And even if I can participate in interviews, like, uh, I did, um, there was a Nora Ephron doc that Bradford set the look for and kind of set up. And then, you know, I, I did some of the interviews in LA and it was sort of peppered with DPs in different, you know, places. And it's like, I love, like, I love to day play on documentaries because you just get to hear fascinating people talk. Um, Oh, very cool. <laughs> and then Mudbound. Such a beautiful film. Amazing. <laughs> what, uh, I mean, that was, um, I'm trying to think, I remember having a conversation with you, but I mean, you guys were deep, deep location for that. Yes. And an amazing, amazing crew and cast too. It's really cool. I am. Um, I love this. Is, we, we were based out of New Orleans. We were shooting um, about an hour. Or I don't know, remember what direction from there. But um, and my crew is amazing. I mean, I, the New I can't say enough good things about the crew in, in New Orleans. Um, my my gaffer Bob Bates is just incredible, and the whole team. Um, I remember, you know, it was one of the first times I'd hired a B camera op that I'd never worked with before. I didn't know and. So I spent the first week with, you know, his monitor. I was shooting handheld with my monitor and his monitor also attached. So I could kind of like look up and glance at what he was framing. And within a week, uh, his name's Rob Stanger. Within a week, I was like, this, he's, he's got a beautiful eye. I'm done, take that monitor off my camera. Like, we're good. Um, you know, this film, so it came about, Dee and I were, were sort of mutual fan, you know, mutual admiration society, I think fans of each other's work. I'd seen Pariah her short before it was Pariah her feature. And, you know, we'd been in and out of the Sundance world together and had spoken on a couple occasions. And then, you know, she called me about this film and I just thought it was such a beautiful story. And so, you know, there were so many layers and characters and, and interweavings, you know, narratives. And I related to, to a lot of it and I empathized with other, other aspects of it. And, um, 
So, you know, we signed on to do this and um, it was fucking hard. Like it, it, I am so proud of the film and it was also so, so fucking hard. You know, I think it was another film where we were trying to do something bigger than the money that we had, which is always a challenge to begin with. But I, I think, to be honest, I was really unprepared for the, the weather, for the condition. Mm -hmm. you know, in the summer, in the South, um, and, you know, beyond the heat, which is just like oppressive and the humidity and all these things, we had no, as you can see, we're sort of in this plantation in the middle of nowhere. We had no respite. There was no shade, there were no tree, you know, it was like, um, but it's also it, like, it's a continuity nightmare. You basically like start the day sunny, the clouds, you know, the, the pressure builds up and then somewhere around like 2 p.m., full storm rolls in, rain, like pouring rain, and then it clears up and it's sunny again. And it's like, it's just so hard to work in that because it's like you're, you're one foot in and then you have to pivot. And, you know, and also the heat was so oppressive that our schedule changed. Like we originally were going to shoot, like, it was going to be, you know, days and then into nights and then, you know, kind of the way you do it. And then um, the days we, we couldn't waste, I got sun poisoning. I'd never experienced anything like that, like throwing up, faint, I mean, and so that we basically had to shift our schedule into splits because we couldn't do 12 hours of daylight in the middle of the summer with no respite from the heat. Right. Um, but, but it was, you know, anytime you make something that you care about, it's also so fucking rewarding, you know? And it's like, so you do anything for it, right? Like I'm charging the lightning when everybody's like, get back in the van. You know, it's like, you just, it's, it's that, right? Where it's like, you know, like, I got some poisoning because I wanted one more shot. You know, it's like, it, it's just you care. Um, so. Wow. <laughs> but it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, I, you have a title called Mudbound, you know, you're walk, walking into some. some. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then Black Panther. That must have been a, a wild experience. Yeah. You know, the wildest thing for me going into Panther was that I, I didn't have an intermediate step. You know, Ryan and Hannah, who's our production designer, and you know, our editors, like everybody else from Fruitvale had done Creed. And I was supposed to do Creed, and then it just between, it ended up shooting from January to March, and I was due with uh, my first son, Wiley, in February. And it was like, any other dates, you know, I could have shot pregnant, I could have had the baby brought baby set, but I was literally doing the middle of set. So basically I had no middle training ground. I was going from these like relatively small movies, I was going from small movies to this gargantuan thing. Um, you know, I'd done a little bit of VFX here and there, but like I hadn't done many big commercials. I actually, you know, was virtually unhirable on commercials before the sort of one, two punch of, of my band of Black Panther. Um, so it's like, I, I just had never used these bigger tools. Um, and like I said, I, I, I didn't have a mentor. So for me, it was just this walking into this huge unknown and it really took everything from, you know, Ryan's faith in me, um, which speaks to that kind of a partnership. And then, you know, my own inner, inner confidence that I would just figure it out, you know? And, and so um, I guess figure out, I did. I mean, ultimately, like now I can say, looking back that like, it's really, I mean, a movie that big is, it's, you know, it's all the, the skill set you've been building just on a massive level. It's, you know, it's, it's team, team, you know, leadership and communication and collaboration, all of these things. And then it's also, um, you know, it's actually just a lot of common sense. VFX is just common sense. You know what I mean? It's, it's not, it's not actually this magical thing. It's like, there are usually two or three ways to go about it and you make a plan with the VFX supervisor and the production designer and everybody else and you decide like this is the way we're going to achieve it. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, um, but you know, going into Panther also, I, I'd never seen Marvel movies. I never read comic books. Like it was just not my world. So I, I also had to like learn the language from the beginning. Like I started by literally, how do you read a comic book? And then I watched, you know, the Marvel films and I knew Ryan was going to do something special with this one. You know, I, I wouldn't have, I mean, I wouldn't have signed on if I, A, I mean, I would, anything Ryan says he would, he's going to do, I would do because I just had that much faith in him. But also 
I just, I knew he was going to find a way to kind of break the mold. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm really proud of the film. And I'm, I'm proud of, you know, the reality is a lot of the movies I make sort of, we're sort of preaching to the choir. And the nice thing about Panther is the messaging was able to, I think, you know, reach across the line, I think, for lack of a better word. Yep. Yep. And uh, so now you're directing, which is, you know, congratulations first and foremost on Hightown premiering this weekend. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> um, I am, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm directing and shooting. Like I'm, I'm not that I'm directing and shooting the same projects necessarily, but I will forever be a DP and I will forever continue to DP. So I'm not, not leaving one thing for another. I'm, I'm just sort of trying some new things at the same time. I'm, I'm becoming a multi-hyphenate, I guess. Um, and that even kind of came about in a bit of a roundabout way. You know, it actually started five years ago. Um, John Ridley, who did, who wrote 12 Years a Slave, um, tapped me to direct an episode of American Crime. And, like this is an anthology series he was doing. And I was a little bit like, you know, who, it was based on conversations we had had. Like he, he really just, you know, and I had, it had been percolating a little bit because everybody that I'd ever shot for, including Ryan, including Rick, you know, have sort of said, you, you think like a director, you would make a great director, you should try directing, you know, if you ever want to direct, I'll help you or I'll produce, you know, you hear that enough and it starts to percolate. Um, but I think I was nervous. It was not something I trained for and, and I loved shooting. So did a little bit, I, so I directed American Crime, it went great. I did another episode, it went really well. And the floodgates kind of opened to episodic directing. And this was five years ago. This was before Time's Up. This was before even the push. I mean, there was, I guess, this, a little bit of a push for more women filmmakers, but like, um, I had all these opportunities and I was like, I wasn't ready to close the door to shooting. And I felt like in episodic TV, you have to, you commit so far in advance, like, you know, you're committing to projects as a director months out and as a DP, I get a call like, what are you doing in three weeks? And it was, they were starting to kind of, it, did, it just wasn't gonna work. And so I chose shooting. And I think it's because I knew I still had a mud bound in me and a Black Panther in me. I had so much more I wanted to like say and do as a DP. Um, and so I kind of shut the door to directing and I shot my bound, I shot Black Panther. And then the past year or two, I'd been reading scripts. I mean, you know, so at this point I had directing agents, but I largely kind of shelved the idea of it, but I'd been reading occasional feature scripts or whatever. And, you know, I've been reading things in the last couple of years and it felt like a lot of the films out, you know, drama has gone to TV, so much of it has. And that's my lifeblood. Like I wasn't just that I wanted to shoot films, I wanted to shoot big scopey dramas. I wanted to shoot, you know, Road to Perdition with rain and, you know, rain towers and Blade Runner and just tools and time and big and, but still dramas. And it's like, my, my, it's almost a joke that I, well, joke, I cry that I like, I arrived at the target like a decade too late. You know what I mean? Like nobody's making big scopey drama. Three people are making them. Nolan, you know, no one's got his DP, whatever. Anyway, the, the people who, who actually make the hundred million dollar movies have Sin Carvers already. So, I, I realized I had to cast a wider net and I started to think about it as just storytelling. I want to tell stories I care about. So if I, you know, the best thing I can do for myself is read and whether it's as a DP or as a director, just find a story that I feel like is worth, you know, especially now that I'm a mom, if I take on a project, I'm like choosing it over my family almost, you know, and it's like, I have to believe in it or believe that there's something to say. I don't know. So I just started reading both. Um, and, you know, Hightown came about, it was sort of a window of time where I had some time and it was just, you know, there were things about it that were very relatable to me. I grew up going to Cape Cod, you know, it's a, it's a queer uh, protagonist, but it's not, a, it's not a, a narrative about being queer. I kind of, you know, I, I tend to sort of run the other direction when people want to make things that are specifically like about being gay, about being like it's, there's so much more to who we all are that it like, I just, you know, I like things that have their own storylines, but have interesting layered characters. Um, and so Hightown was sort of rife with that. And it was a chance to kind of cut my teeth a little bit before I went off and did a feature. Um, 
and it was it was an ama- you know it was another amazing experience. So uh, we, yeah. that, that's airing now. Um, I think it's for free for the next like three days. Even I think it's on Amazon Prime too. Um, and then it's you know a star show. Um, yeah. Very cool. And and on that note, I'm really excited to hear about your feature. I know that it's it's been tough because you were just taking off and then this hit. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, I mean I, so the 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 thing that spoke to me was a film called uh Flint Strong, which is not what the title will likely end up being. It is not about the water crisis. Um it is a film written by Barry Jenkins of Moonlight and if Bill Street can talk, uh, you know, um, and it is a really beautiful and powerful story about a powerful woman named Clarissa Shields, who's a boxer from Flint, Michigan, um, and is just a force. She's a force of resilience, I'll put it that way. Um, and I, there's something in it that, you know, I, I felt like there were, there were, there was enough that was personal to me that I felt like I could put something into it. Um, you have Flint as a character, you have, you know, it's a boxing movie. Who doesn't want a chance at a boxing movie? That said, there's so many great boxing movies. I also feel like, fuck. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And so we were, you know, I ended up hiring uh, Caitlin Arismendi to, to shoot it for me. Um, and we were needy, nasty. We, we'd started, we did two days of Flint photography and we were supposed to start our principal photography on, you know, Monday, whatever that was, the 14th or something. And on the 12th, you know, this, this whole, uh, whatever it is started. Mm, yeah. That was nice. Um, so yeah, but hopefully we'll get back to it whenever it's safe to do so. I mean, everything's literally, the trucks are loaded. We have, you know, Key and McKenzie, our production designer designed this beautiful, you know, her sort of boxing training facility. It's more like a rec house. Um, mm. And it's, it's all built and ready to go. And there's gear in a truck and we just need to get back to it. Oh, I hope soon because I can't wait to see it. <laughs> we have some really awesome questions coming in from the audience. I'd like to take a few of those if that's okay. <laughs> there's, um, there's one here that's, uh, I, I think this is like a reoccurring theme and I and love to hear your take on it. And it's in the digital age now, you know, can you talk about the steps that you take to protect the integrity of the image and mm-hmm. through the release? Um, so I learned early on, you know, that, that about this thing called daily's love, you know, the, the idea that your director falls in love with the footage that they're working with. And it's very hard later on to change their mind about things, even little things. And that sort of became my, you know, that's, that was imprinted on me. And so I really, really, really try, whether it's film or digital, to get the dailies to a place that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of and that, that I feel like could hold up, you know, at the finish line. And it's really, it's worked for me, you know, in the sense that usually then when you get to the DI, you're just finessing. It's like you get to do the little, you know, maybe you, power window a wall or you pop somebody's eyes or whatever but it's like you're not reinventing the wheel later um and the way that I do I mean there's a number of ways I mean it's mostly just communication right you're working with if it's on set you know with your DIT um you know and if it's offset it's like if it's film we're communicating through stills and usually before I let anybody put dailies down I I take a look at a, a still you know and then anything that needs a change gets a change before the dailies, you know, get laid down. And occasionally if a daily comes through and I'm not happy with it, I'll, um, you know, I'll ask if we can redo it and, you know, receive more magenta, whatever it is, but like, so that things are getting close to the end result. Um, and then as far as, you know, I mean, look, I've been pretty fortunate that I haven't had that film where a producer has come in at the end and completely reimagine the thing. If anything, ironically, the producer, this speaks to the Daily Love, it wasn't the, I was worried that it was going to be the director, but it was the producer who I love and is a dear friend who literally showed up, you know, four days into the, the DI or something with his laptop from the dailies and was side by side, you know, mm, I think I liked it better when, you know, and it's just like, but <laughs> real, you know. Um, but I haven't had the film where somebody has come in after the fact and 
and blown my whole idea out, out the, the you know out of the water. Mm. Um, but I, know, I mean, look, it's possible. I mean, at the end of the at the end of the day, money money does talk. Like I do, I have had you know, I mean, in TV, right? You're as an episodic director, you direct the thing and then you hand it off and somebody else finishes it. Um, so even like you know, High Town actually, I was very fortunate that they didn't adjust my pilot cut very much, but you know, the music, I mean, some of it we're never going to be able to afford. And then, you know, the person who's making the choices about which songs from your cut stay and which get replaced, like, you know, it's not you. And so, like, I heard one song that wasn't my song, and I was like, oh, that's it. It's not mine anymore, you know. And I have to get over that a little bit. Um, but there is some element of, you know, unless you're, unless you're Martin Scorsese and have the director's cut, like, it may not be the exact specific thing that you, you know, there's a little bit of other people's opinions creeping in and that's good too. That's beautiful. You know, I think part of choosing film as a, you know, as a collaborative media medium is recognizing that you're going to get this melding. Like I think you just, you have to look at it as a bit of a beautiful goulash because you know, it's not one person making the thing from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it's better for that. You know, it's better for all of the different ingredients in the process. Right. Very cool. And formats. So you've mixed formats on some projects where you've shot in spherical and anamorphic. Um, and then I think on Hightown, did we do uh, large format as well as Super 35 as well on that first we, episode? We did. We, we mixed lenses more than mixing formats, I think. Um, I think we were in the LF world, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Were we LF? Well, we did uh, on High Town. We went Venice. I remember we talked about that, and we looked at yeah, six K um, versus the four K, and yeah. yeah. Oh, you know what? We I mean, we we did actually, right? We probably for some of the wide shots went six K, and then some of the more intimate scenes went four K. And I forget some of the reasoning, and you'd have to like I wasn't the DP on that one. And and one of the things that I'm learning as a director is to not fixate on some of the like the. The first thing I can let go is the like super technical, are we 4K or 6K in the scene? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm never gonna be, I'm never gonna be able to let go of like what lenses we choose and you know, the camera move, like as much as I probably should in some respects learn to like, you know, focus on the performance and let go of, of what I know as a DP. I don't, I don't know that that's possible. You know, I, I also, have to be honest about that. But the least I can do for myself is not be worrying about like what resolution we're at. You know what I mean? So I, the, the long, the short of it is how to rate him. But yeah. you know, <laughs> definitely mixed lenses and some of them weren't large format lenses. So I think that informed a lot of it. Yeah. And then on, was it on Mudbound you did a little bit of spherical and anamorphic? Was that, was that mixed? You guys sure? Sure too. Um, you know, the, the it was, a, the reasoning for both of those films was was twofold. One is I love anamorphic. Oh, I have a visitor. All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. You remember so big. Miley at the camera test when we tested the sixty five. I mean, were you yeah. at the sixty five? No, I, was, I don't. I don't think so. But you sent us that picture. We have to put that picture up. This is fantastic. I, they were exactly the same weight. Is what I remember. The sixty five millimeter camera <laughs> Miley at the time. Um, so I, the reason why I mixed on, oh, I know what I'm saying, is that anamorphic flares were not, I love the bokeh from, from my dad. Um, what is it, what is what? Oh, this is, can you, this is Gus, and we're talking to Ari. Yeah. <laughs> Last time I saw him, we were having pizza. There he is, oh my gosh. <laughs> That's me. That's you, do you remember that? Um, oh, I wanna talk about that too. All right, so let me yeah. finish. The reason why I mixed them was because I didn't want the anamorphic flare. Yeah. There's an exciting thing on that. Yeah. She said that. All good. <laughs> um, maybe, she, well, a nice one. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll be really fun to you. A really fun one for me? Um, Sounds like ice cream. Nope. Every day, like in the afternoon, when you're done, Working, we could go in the pool and clean up. Oh, that sounds like a I'll great. Map. I love it. Yeah. 
Hold on, wait. Can I take it? Okay, you're gonna have to let me talk for a little bit, bud. <laughs> um, Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wanted the imperfection and the fall off and a, a lot of the things about, it was, that was C-series and, and actually some B and some D. And it, okay. you wanna talk about some more? Okay. I'm just so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, and that was her idea, so, um, she said she could, we could do it, but only if I want to do it. Okay, and that sounds like a good plan. So I think you're going to need to I'm, I'm on camera right now. No, okay. So it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's so, great to see him. <laughs> yeah. It's getting okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I knew that I, that the, that the flare felt a little futuristic. Like I, I wanted kind of built the, the lending to have the artifacting and the softening. And I love the book for Like there were all these things that worked, but then there were a few things that almost feel like a tell. And I didn't want the glass to be ahead of the time, you know? Um, and so sometimes I would switch out to, to spherical specifically for the flare. Um, and then, you know, there were a few times at night where I just, I knew I needed to stop. Like I wanted to light, you know, there were times where I wanted to be able to light fully with candlelight and, you know, a two eight just won't, won't get you there. Like not for what I'm trying to do. So it was, it was more like an anamorphic show with Spherical as my like safety net. Um, and, and Seaberg wasn't actually too different. Like it was a similar concept. It was, you know, a, a period film. I guess with Seaberg it was a little bit more about the close focus too. Um, and, and wanting, you know, times wanting to be able to, you know, there, there are just certain things that Spherical lenses do that anamorphic don't, you know, and that if you need to go from six inches to infinity or if you, don't want a you know horizontal flare or whatever it was like i would switch them out for those moments and shooting on seabird because it was film right. i definitely needed to stop sometimes at night um so yeah wow very cool and then sorry we so we kind of bounced around there but yes testing formats as in the photo we saw yeah that was <laughs> so i told zorin um you know and craig uh bauer who is you know used to be zorin's second and is now a, a very talented operator um, who started actually on Panther operating. But um, he, I told him what I wanted to do, which was like, I just, I wanted to shoot it all at the same time. You know, it's so often you're switching, you're trying to test formats, but you're switching, um, you know, you're switching between cameras, between lenses. And it's like, there's just so many other variables. And I was really trying to get the best like apples to apples comparison. Um, obviously, there's some issues with parallaxing, but I was like, get the cameras as close as you possibly can. You know, I want to be able to do movement and all of that. So we, we as you can see, I think we tested. And the, the other thing is Marvel had promised Ryan, you know, that we could test film. They didn't promise we could shoot it, but they promised we could test it. <laughs> what you're looking at there is um, an IMAX, basically, you know, 15 perf, 5 perf, spherical 35, Anamorphic 35, Spherical Alexa, Anamorphic Alexa, um, uh, the red, I don't know what, what they were at at the time, Monstro or something. Um, and then the, um, what's the Panavision uh, camera that, that has the internal like um, light iron kind of spec? Uh, the, the DXL. Mm -hmm. DXL. So that's, that's, that's what you're looking at. And then, you know, we did, a, I ran it through a range of scenarios from, you know, broad daylight, sunset and dusk, you know, partly to see like how the digital and film could handle that, you know, how much more latitude you'd get from the digital and dusk. And then, you know, at night we did a whole, you know, dimmer, dimmer chase of like, we did a saturated colorful look, we did a tungsten look, we did a, you know, a moonlight look and kind of, and literally you're recording all of the same, you know, all at the same time. What we couldn't do is match the focal lengths perfectly. So it wasn't like you had exactly, exactly, you know, apples, apples, but it was pretty close. And it's, it's amazing. You don't, I mean, who gets to do that? Like that, that right there is, you know, a once in a lifetime experience. Did you, did you, uh, were you surprised by anything when you got to view those tests? Um, you know, it was, more informative than surprising. Like, you know, I've always, everyone, me like everyone has always responded to the Alexa over the red for skin tones. But what you realize is that when it comes to saturated colors, at least at the time, the red actually handled the saturation better. 
And, and it makes sense, right? Like, of course, that's why our skin looks better in, in a world that's a little less, you know, saturated and colorful. Like, it was more like, oh, okay, I get it now. Like, than being completely shocked by anything. Obviously, I mean, the film held the colors beautifully, um, but it also crapped out when it got dark, you know? Like, we got an extra 20 minutes of dusk in our digital world, you know? So it's like, you just, you have to really, take into account the pros and cons of, of each tool, which is why I try not to say like, I am a this, you know, it's why I never own glass. Like, I don't want to own glass because I don't want to feel like I should shoot the same set of lenses on every film um, because they own them. Like, it is one of the few things that, that can tell us apart now. And that mm. said, Deacon's fucking, I mean, how the fuck he does it with his Master Prime, which is not my favorite set of glass, but, stomach every fucking time so you know it works for, it works for some people just not for me <laughs> so on that note so you said you don't like owning glass but uh, i actually have uh, quite a few questions coming in asking about equipment and you know do you own equipment as a cinematographer photographer so i I, I didn't at the beginning, and I was I was definitely the, the kid out of school who, you know, was jealous of all the other people who were getting hired because they own cameras. Um, and at the same time, telling myself that anyone who hires you because you own a camera isn't the person you want to be working with. So trying to make myself feel better that way. And then as I got um, a little bit, you know, as I got a little bit more prolific and I had a little bit of money, I did you know, first when I was in the doc world, I had a C300, which worked a good amount. And then when I got out of the doc world, I immediately got rid of that. And then I, um, I owned, uh, I owned a, a co-owned an Amira briefly, um, which was kind of probably as I was transitioning from doc to narrative, because it kind of could do both. And then I owned an Alexa, and the Alexa went with me on Mudbound, on Panther, on, might have been... I can't remember whether that might have, may have just been those features and then it was sort of in the commercial world. And then I, at some point I sold that too, because I felt like, I mean, it was as the, you know, the, the medium format sensors were coming out and I actually, now I don't, I mean, I, I don't, maybe because I'm dabbling in directing or whatever else, I just feel like it's not worth the headache. Um, I've never been great at managing equipment. Um, and yeah, I mean, I usually find myself trying to track down parts that have, been at this commercial rental house and there, you know, it's just, it's, it's not me. And it's the same. <laughs> yeah. I was never an AC. I think people assume that there's like this track that we all take. I would be a horrific AC. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm messy. I'm, I'm the creative that like can't keep things organized. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I shoot from the heart and I, and I do think I have a, a really good technical baseline. I'm also like math is my thing. I'm good at math, I'm good at science, but like I'm a fucking mess. I could not, keep thing I couldn't pull focus I couldn't keep lenses organized I couldn't it's just a different skill set um but you know look if you have money great um I also never had an abundance of money to own gear with so no and I, I can't believe the hours already there but uh I do want to just because it's coming in from a lot of people a lot of people just asking for simple words of advice as they're getting ready to start their career from you mm -hmm. I would say that the two things that have, I don't know, the two things that resonate for me are be true to yourself. You know, like you will get carrots dangled that feel like, you know, I mean, they're that, they're carrots, right? Like the first, I've been doing all these indie movies and the first studio movie that I was offered to even meet on was so not right for me. Like it, you know, but it was a big movie. And I said, no, I mean, I, I didn't even meet on it. But like, I knew I wanted to, you know, or, or for instance, like I'm very much a drama girl. So it's like, I, I'm not gonna go shoot a horror movie, even though it's probably beautiful. You know, like visually I can understand why people love it, but it's just not my thing. You know, people love to pigeonhole you in, in film. And so it's like, you shoot one comedy and like, that's gonna be your bread and butter for the next, it's, you're gonna have a harder time getting out of comedy now than had you just never done it, you know what I mean? And so. I would just say, like, if you, if you have a sense of what it is that you like to do specifically, because also it just never hurts to be specific, you know, like, you know, you want to tell stories that are going to move people or that are going to move you or, you know, I don't know. Um, that's, that's, and I guess along with it is like, 
the, the thing about choosing projects that you care about and that you love is even if they don't succeed, you still can feel good about what you're putting out into the world, you know, as opposed to, I don't know, taking the money gig because that's, that's not why we're in this business. Like, you know, like at least for me, it's, it's, we're, all, we're already putting ourselves on the line. Like you may as well go all the way with it. And then the other thing I would say is just, you know, persistence. It's like, I've had a relatively fast go at it and it's still been years. I mean, I've, I, you know, I've, I've been doing this for, not to date myself, but like the better part of two decades. Um, and so I think there's this feeling, I mean, I certainly remember it, like that you come out of school and you're just gonna, that's it, you're gonna be shooting, you know, and, and there are three people in the world for whom that happens and good for them. But for most people, it's like, it is, you're, all, you're in it for the long haul and you just have to like, you have to enjoy the journey because you may never get to the destination, you know what I mean? And, and even if you do, it will probably take a very long time. So I don't know, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the trip. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much again for making the time for us. It's great to see you. Great to see Wiley. Ah. Hopefully we'll talk soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rich. And I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. Um, please join us again next week. We're going to be sitting down with cinematographer Joe Anderson and talk to him about uh, his work and his career. And our episodes will be available on our website, airyrental.com where you can also check out all of our unique and exciting products. And you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash Airy Rental Group. And until next time, cheers, everyone. <laughs>